Welcome to Epicenter, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and people driving decentralization and the blockchain revolution. Uh, I'm Brian Frayne, and I'm here with Felix Lutsch. And today we're going to speak with Stefan Goslin. He is the founder of Frontier Research. Frontier is a sort of new uh, MEV-focused company, but he was also previously uh, one of the co-founders of Flashbots, and I think sort of the lead architect, I think if that's correct, or product designer or something like that uh, at Flashbots. So thanks so much for joining us, Stefan. Yeah, thank you. It's always a pleasure to get the chance to come back on this podcast and chat with you guys. Yeah, absolutely. It's not the first time. Actually, maybe you can just get started in there. I think this is a great question. So 2020, uh, you wrote a blog post or a post on ETH Research titled Flashbots Frontrunning the MEV Crisis. So this is now three years ago. And I'm curious just if you can like reflect a little bit, sort of looking back. I mean, you, you, you called it back then like MEV Crisis. I'm curious, you know, what what did you... What was your understanding of like the MEV crisis and like what does it look like today? Are we in an MEV crisis? I was forced to like think back on this actually earlier today. Someone asked like, do we actually have a counterfactual to PBS? Like what would have happened if we hadn't launched MF Boost? Would we actually have a significantly different distribution of concentration on the validator side? Or would it look like pretty similar? The... MEV crisis was basically the thesis that said if there wasn't action taken by the community and early Flashbots members who sort of felt responsible to take this, this action, there would be an increase in concentration of hashing power because um, the level of activity on Ethereum was increasing to the point where MEV became meaningful. I remember during um, summer 2020, DeFi summer, we had all of the sort of start of the yield farming and like really Uniswap getting traction for the first time with all the liquidity mining programs. Um, it was at Yam Finance and and all this 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 good stuff. And so it was clear that you know whether it's token sniping, arbitrage, whatever else. There was an advantage of operating this at the validator level and validators weren't currently doing it the activity was happening through the transaction pool through sort of gaming the the algorithm that the miners run for for packing blocks um so the crisis was well it's very clear that miners have the advantage in doing these games they are likely to like start to invest into running things themselves or run custom clients, make partnerships with trading firms to be able to extract some of that value. And that has the potential to lead towards more concentration because there's sort of increasing returns to being the ones that, that play this role. Maybe there is a better mechanism that we can develop and, and, and launch that enables to maintain transparency over, um, over what is, uh, is sort of happening in the system may, and maintain open access to it. So make it so it's not doesn't require a special deal with validators, but you can freely connect and, and participate. And finally, have some way to sort of redistribute the value um, to the actors in a way that's like welfare maximizing or whatever definition that, that you can have. So that's, that's the MEV crisis. It, you know, you, you sort of mentioned like, hey, you wrote this post and you made it on ETH research. And then I'm like thinking back to like the last three years of my life. And I feel like all I did was write two posts and like everything else was like fluff. Right, like I wrote this front running the MEV crisis, which was like a spec for Mavgeth, which was like the client that 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 we developed and then ended up getting adopted by by miners. And the second one that I wrote was introducing Mev Boost as a as a spec. And then <laughs> maybe like I should have just written those things and just like you know went to the beach and did nothing else for the rest of the time <laughs> because like those specs alone I feel like move the needle into like what the infrastructure looks like um, and and uh, and were like the most impactful things that uh, that I really did so yeah I, I sort of there's this like really fun progression from you know there not being any infrastructure to now having gone through two major cycles of of the MEV infrastructure changing on Ethereum. And, and do you feel like these uh, both of these things had the impact that you hoped it would? 
in terms of mitigating the MEV crisis? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> not really. <laughs> <laughs> Um, not really. I mean, it's it's like hard to say. It's like like, shifted no somewhere else. Is that what's happened? Or yeah, I mean, it's like it, it achieved the like the outcome in terms of like it's a system that got adopted and like everyone got excited about it and and you know introduce a, a new industry and ecosystem with a lot of people that are having open discussions about these things and implementing alternative solutions to them. The MEV crisis in itself, I mean, one can debate whether it's a crisis at all, if it ever was actually there, um, or if it's just like a natural way that an industry evolves. And whether, you know, whether it was MevGeth, MevBoost, or something else would have happened, the end results would have been the same and we would have ended up in the same location. And at the at the end of the day, I don't know that the amount of concentration that we have at the stake level today is like meaningfully different than what we would have if we didn't have PBS or like any sort of MEV infrastructure. Maybe we have more transparency in how the system works because, you know, we have sort of this open pricing mechanism where the information is being like routed through. We have like a dollar value for like the price of blocks and we have some nice dashboards that like allow us to show it. Like maybe there was some path dependency there that's different. But in terms of like how things are evolving, it seems like pretty inherent to the way that blockchains are designed that the the end result will, will end up being um being fairly similar. Maybe maybe just maybe just commenting here one thing. I at least I do feel like reasonably confident that MEV did not increase validator centralization in a meaningful like was not a meaningful driver for validator centralization on Ethereum. I think that's pretty clear. Yep. So I think from that perspective, if you take if you take like you know concentration on the validator level, then I think if that's the kind of criteria, then I would say like, yeah, no, I think it worked out, right? Like that did, did, that didn't happen. Or it happened to some extent for other reasons that were unrelated to MEV, I think. Right, right. It didn't fail. Yeah. <laughs> we don't know if it was necessary, but we know that it didn't fail. I think the thing that I'm the most excited about in, in the end, and in particular with the introduction of, of MevBoost. Like, so MevGeth was like a really simple solution. It was like, get Flashboss to run a server and then like route all the MEV through this server and then like multiplex it to the, like the miners, right? And it was just like introduce like Flashboss as like a server that like runs the MEV market. MevBoost is a much more sort of open system where you have a lot of different layers um, to it and a lot of room for individual entities to compete and in offering additional services. All right, so the, just the introduction of the, the block builder role um, and the relay role has sort of meant that this thing of operating a, an MEV market that the Flashbots was doing now is being done by like, I don't know, six, seven, eight companies. And there's quite a bit of turnover, I think, in the, like, um, and the dominance of um, of these parties, they're like trying to figure out how to like make it sustainable, how to have a revenue model, and uh, competing for features that they develop. I think that's all very positive because it brings a lot more diversity to the way that these systems are being um, iterated upon, um, and just the number of different perspectives that are being reflected into the the architectures that they get adopted. So that that to me has been like quite successful. If nothing else, just having more different stakeholders are involved in developing and competing against each other for developing this this infrastructure, providing services on top of it. That seems like a quite a decentralized way to approach infrastructure development. So it's almost like the third thing you did, right? Like I guess formalizing this MEV supply chain with the different actors and how you can break them apart and then how you can like separate the roles. Did anything change in, in that perspective from how you looked at the MEV supply chain during MEV boost and like nowadays? Or has there anything you, you haven't foreseen or something? I don't think there's anything that I haven't foreseen. I think what I've been trying to introduce as like a reframing of the MEV supply chain is to think of it less linearly 
and think of it more as sort of a chaotic set of games. I presented a little while ago and we wrote this, this blog post with, with Frontier about, um, about infinite games and uh, introducing this idea of, of a transaction supply network. So instead of, of thinking of MEV supply chain as being like users originate MEV and then it sort of gets sort of funneled through this system of, of extraction all the way to the validator, um, inside, instead do you think about a cluster of a bunch of different infrastructure component that, yeah, it originates with, with users, but depending on, I guess either intents, like whatever they're trying to achieve in, in interacting with the chain, they get routed through different sets of specialized infrastructure that leverage tools like auctions, that leverage tools like privacy um, to provide those services and, and capture that those systems, like reflect that value back to the user um, and provide the utility that the user is looking for. It's kind of like this, this thing to say like, okay, MEV is like a lens through which you can see the world, right? Um, and once you start to look at like bridges, you look at, um, changes, you look at all these different things from the MEV lens, it's like a toolkit that allows you to analyze them and understand how how do the dynamics play out if you set this up in a decentralized setting. Um, I think it's useful to have this lens, but still look at all of these components individually, um, all these games individually, as opposed to say like, there's only one game here and it's like the MEV supply chain and like that's the only thing that matters. I'd rather look at, at individual components. Can you talk a bit about the, your vision for Frontier Research? Like, what do you hope to build? As a, like, what kind of organization do you hope to build, and what kind of impact do you hope to have on, you know, the MEV landscape or crypto more generally? Yeah, um, Frontier Research. So I left Flashbots at the end of of twenty twenty two. Like. Um, and beginning of the fall of 2022. And uh, I so I took some time off and decided, like, is this something I want to continue working on? Do I want to continue working on, on MEV? I felt like there was still some contributions I had to make to the space. And so started sort of a, a research um, organization around this that where it helps working with various different teams that are, um, that are participating across the entire, um, the entire ecosystem of, of MEV infrastructure, help them sort of up level the level the their understanding and mental models around MEV, help do some analysis over the system that they produce and advise on go to market and whatnot. Um, so we've been doing that for quite a few months now since um, since the beginning of of this year. Now we've we've started looking more actively at like, okay, where are the opportunities for developing products? We've started incubating a block builder called um, called Faith Builder. Um, that participates in this game. Um, I sort of see very abstractly um, the set of games as being an abstract set of two two roles. You either have a message passing system with some rules over how these messages are handled and aggregated, and you have individual agents um, that can be called like solvers or searchers or block builders or whatever else that aggregate these messages and then solve them, uh, optimize them according to some objective function. And so the block builder that, uh, that we're running, we see as being sort of fundamental to enabling the development of all these different games across the ecosystem and participating in them and helping them bootstrap uh, to provide these better user services. Um, so it's, um, it's a generalized solver that aims to participate in all of these different, um, these different blockchain games. Um, so yeah, that's that's sort of a, a a venture that we're that we're incubating from uh, from the frontier team. So this means like it's it's a builder in the Flashbots MUV boost ecosystem, but it could also be a solver. Maybe you know I don't know for for CowSwap or like you know other products like that. Is is that correct? They're they're very similar games. At the end of the day, um, they they achieve similar objectives and they sort of are architected in, um, in ways that benefit from participation in multiple of these, of these games. I mean, the move of activity and like the trend, this is like one trend that's, that's interesting to discuss is how, how much RFQs are going to gain in momentum and adoption um, 
over the course of the you know next 12 months. Can you explain RFQs? Yeah, I can give like, maybe I can give like an MEV explanation to it. <laughs> sure, please, yeah. And then I'll give the like, the maybe I'll give the, the user explanation and then the MEV explanation as well. So the user explanation is, you're used to doing trades on top of DeFi by going to like uniswap.com and like requesting a swap. What happens then is you're tapping onto AMM liquidity that's on chain, but you um, have a lot of inefficiency in uh, the prices that you obtain. So the liquidity that's on chain is stale. It um, isn't by professional counterparties um, and you're susceptible to um, sandwiching attacks and like exploitation of your orders if you if you um, if you route it through there, so it doesn't give you very good pricing essentially um, to interact with um, with Uniswap relative to um, the pricing that professional traders would be able to get by interacting with all the different liquidity venues. RFQ just allows you to outsource the work of. Uh, routing through a bunch of different liquidity venues to some solving system. Um, it says, hey, we're going to introduce a marketplace of service providers that are going to compete to give you the best price. Um, and they can do the complex work of figuring out how to uh, access liquidity wherever uh, wherever it is. On the user side, it's great. You have the same experience of doing a swap and getting the tokens that you want, but you can also expect to get better pricing on um, on the trades that uh, that you do. The MEV lens is uh, RFQs like recapture value that's being leaked sort of down the supply chain, right? Um, so if you look at the distribution of validator revenues today, over fifty percent of it comes from basically arbitrage against Uniswap LPs, right? And so. Uniswap LPs put a bunch of capital into into their AMM pools, and they're relying on CFI DeFi arbitragers to update the prices that they offer uh, relative to the prices on other liquidity venues like Binance and, and whatnot. Um, and the arbitragers are capturing a significant amount of value. The AMM LPs are losing that value, and this is called LVR, um, loss versus rebalancing. There's a service that these arbitragers are offering, which is to maintain prices on chain. It comes at a significant cost for uh, the LPs, and a lot of that value ends up being captured by uh, by validators. What RFQ does is it says, "Okay, thank you very much for like the system that was like generating a lot of value for validators. Like we, as the originators of this order flow, would rather recapture this value either for ourselves or for our users." And so we're going to create the system that enables us to internalize essentially the liquidity uh, and provide uh, that value back to uh, to our users. So the sort of trend on on this RFQ stuff is for more and more of the liquidity to move off chain, to move away from from AMM contracts, and be sort of accessible by these professional market makers, these professional solvers that um, that can get better price improvements to the users and, and better quotes to the users um, and uh, and expose less of that sort of down towards uh, towards validators. And then in this RFQ example, so let's say uh, I'm on Ethereum, you know, I want to trade some ETH for USDC, for example. Then I'm making this request for quotation or something. And then... It's like, hey, I want, uh, I have ETH, I want USDC. It, it, this also means that somebody could come and say, hey, I'm a trading company and I can make that trade on Binance and here's how many, uh, you know, USDC I will give you for this ETH and, you know, it nothing ever settled. I mean, of course, they're, they're going to send me the USDC on Ethereum but um, but the trade actually gets executed on Binance. So this would be this would be possible, or that's like yeah, that's mostly how 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 RFQs work. Um, traders don't necessarily need to make the trade on on Binance. At the end of the day, like they hold a bunch of tokens on chain, and they like hedge their exposure on on other venues. Um, 
So basically it's like they have inventory on Ethereum that they are providing within their market making. And um, their goal is to keep this inventory within some range of parameters that's like in line with their hedging on the, on the centralized exchange. And yeah, whenever this inventory goes like too far in one direction or another, then they lose money. But so long as it stays within a certain range, then they, they make money. Maybe let's talk about block building. I feel like block building is something that's very poorly understood, I think, by most people. Uh, even probably even Ethereum users, they have like no idea, right? That like validators are not actually building the blocks and it happens in some other way and 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 how that's happening. So can you just explain what what is the the what's block building and what is the the block building landscape in Ethereum at the moment? Yeah, so block building is um, is basically validators outsourcing the job of putting transactions into a block to a marketplace. Anyone can be a block builder. Anyone can like spin one up. Not everyone can be a good block builder because block builder is very dependent on having access to order flow. Um, so there's a trend here, which is increasing amounts of private order flow uh, that's being routed to block builders. Interestingly enough, right? Like a lot of the discussion there was initially like, oh no, block builders are going to get exclusive order flow deals and uh, become super dominant and it'll be centralizing towards, um, towards the chain because you'll have just like one party that produces all the blocks. Um, Realistically, I think that's there's a lot of economic dynamics that mean that that's not going to be the case. What is happening is there's an increasing adoption of um, order flow aggregation systems. Um, so more and more of the transaction flow is being routed through systems that um, say we will directly send to block builders. We'll send to all the block builders, but we'll directly send to the block builders and never touch the the public transaction pool. And so essentially, if you're, if you're a block builder, you have to connect all these different private sources of order flow to be able to um, build competitive blocks. You compete on this access to the order flow, compete on the efficiency of the merging, and then submit blocks to, to validators for, um, for inclusion. There's sort of two types of block builders. There's block builders that generate their own order flow themselves, which you could call uh, integrated sort of searcher builders. A lot of the dominant block builders to date have been of this kind. Um, they, you know, don't really monetize from playing the role of the block builder. The block builder is sort of a way for them to execute trades um, that they would uh, that they would want to execute anyways, and have some edge in in providing this execution. Um, and then the second type of block builder are, are sort of neutral block builders, and they're the ones that don't generate. Um, order flow themselves. They don't do trading themselves. They just aggregate the trading as done by by a bunch of of other searchers, traders, um, and provide sort of fair execution across all all that uh, that flow. And that's like one of the big questions right now on the block building side is is it inevitable for block builders to be traders, or um, can neutral block builders provide uh, services and and be competitive? So. If you if you think about the business model of the builder searcher, I guess they make the money through their own searching, and the neutral block builder has to sort of come up with some way to to make money from the private order flow. Or how do you kind of attract the order flow just by being a neutral party? Is that basically the the strategy, or you know, I guess whatever you can share, or how how do they compete with this like integrated builder? I mean, either you're like doing the trading yourself, or you're or you're providing some service to someone that wants to sell transactions on chain, right? Let's say that you're a trader, right? You're you're considering like running a block builder. It's not easy to run a block builder. Like, not everyone can do it. Not everyone can get access to all the private order flow that's required. Um, so you have like some some cost, right? Like you have some some potential revenue versus cost calculation that says like, are we going to do trading or not? Or do block building or not? Um, so they're they're willing to pay for someone else to provide that service if they don't have to sort of spin up themselves. I think this exists with several other systems as well, um, where like they would be willing to um, to submit flow to, uh, to a block builder if they can get certain guarantees or like partnership on, on how it works. 
I genuinely don't think block building alone is a very good business um, to run. It's like very competitive marketplace. And um, unless you're able to get some, um, some very like special deals, basically the, the profits get competed away. So the model is not, is not necessarily super attractive. So what, what is going to be the, the kind of future of block building? So th you think there's like other products that are going to be built, um, by block builders? And what do you think are the most promising ones? Like, I think there's two trends that are worth keeping an eye on. One is a transition of order flow from, um, from public venues to, uh, private venues in particular, like just the transition of Uniswap order flow from the mempool to Uniswap X, um, that will influence a lot of different things. I think that will mean that searcher builders become less competitive and less important, um, and uh, neutral builders will become more uh, more prominent. Can you, can you explain why? And and, and may maybe just also explain what is Uniswap X because I think uh, many people will not be familiar with that. Uniswap X is like the RFQ platform, basically that Uniswap launched. Um, work similarly to, uh, to one inch, uh, fusion, similarly to, to CalSwap in some ways as well. It aims to use all sources of liquidity to be able to provide price improvements through running an auction with a bunch of professional, uh, private market makers, uh, for the right to settle a, um, a swap. So what, what this does is. It transitions a lot of activity away from the public transaction pool. So you can say sort of goodbye to all the Sano chain, which is great, uh, great for users, um, but also reduces sort of the opportunity space for those trades to take place. It makes providing liquidity as a passive LP and AMMs a lot more difficult because you have active market makers that have first look on all the retail orders and the chance to settle those. And so as a liquidity provider in an EMM, you sort of just get all of the leftovers that for whatever reason, the, um, the professional market makers aren't settling. So you have to ask yourself, like, why aren't the professional market makers settling this? And why do I, why am I as a retail, you know, do I believe that, uh, I'm making money off of, off of this trade? Um, the answer is like, probably you're not. Um, and so I expect there to be just like a decrease in the amount of liquidity that's available on, um, on, on layer one, um, AMMs, um, and more and more of that, uh, that trading to sort of settle on, on this either, um, private liquidity or, or layer two, uh, this in turn, like sort of reduces the arbitrage opportunity between the layer one and like other trading venues. And like if you have less liquidity that's available to be targeted, um, you will expose less value. Separately, there's like Uniswap V4 and like hooks and like other like mitigations are being developed to be able to reduce the amount of LVR that are exposed by passive LPs. Um, essentially, all these microstructure changes that Uniswap is introducing reduce the amount of MEV that gets exposed in the system and reduce the opportunity for integrated searcher builders to sort of you know, have a significant portion of the value of the blocks. Um, so more and more of, I think the value of the blocks is going to be distributed towards other, um, other use cases relative to just arbitraging Uniswap that will cause this, the shift away from, uh, from searcher builders towards more neutral building. And then how do like neutral builders differentiate? I guess maybe we, we went into a bit, but is it mostly on this, like so offers they can make for private order flow or what other like dimensions are there to differentiate for a neutral builder? I don't really think that there is. I think it's like a knife fight. <laughs> I think just do it better. And, um, what are your thoughts on, um, decentralizing uh, the block builder is this do you think this is uh is it possible to build a decentralized block builder that would be competitive and is there a reason to do it 
Um, I'd say it's, I mean, I don't know that much I will say about what decentralized block building actually looks like and the, the designs that I've seen or the attempts at it have been like unconvincing. There's like this bigger question mark, which is like, what does decentralization actually mean that like needs to be answered when you're even like trying to tackle these questions and the answers I've seen haven't necessarily made much sense to me. This is like a very deep rabbit hole to like dive, dive into. Um, I, I see all of these things as like games that, you, that you're developing. And, and um, the main metric to me about um, how decentralized it is, is what are the uh, barriers to entry and the um, advantages to like to scale or to network effects that, that the system um, uh, involves. And I think the definitions and like proposals for decentralized block buildings to me are like trading off what is like a competitive market with individual agents for uh, like a network that has network effects. And to me, that doesn't necessarily feel more decentralized. Um, maybe there's, there's something I'm missing, but it is susceptible to same centralization pressures at different nodes of the network as any participant in a latency system have. Um, and so while it may have properties and look like a network, um, it doesn't necessarily seem very decentralized to me. So I don't know. I don't know where decentralized block building is, is headed. I think there'll be a lot of experiments and attempts at, um, at developing it. Um, I, would tend to believe that there's there's some something promising I think to be said for um, adding more constraints to the way that block building works, um, and essentially giving validators the more control um, over the policies of what they um, accept as blocks, and maybe you could say that that sort of decentralizes the the role of block building a little bit by constraining them to some set of rules that are enforced at the validator level. Um, and so you are uh, leveraging sort of more distributed validator set um, and the requests that those validators may have while um, still having the block builder role to, uh, to actually enact those, um, those requests. That might be like a, a direction for, for more um, trustless uh, block building. But yeah, is there like a specific approach to, to decentralized block building that you've looked at? I mean, it, it's, I, I guess there's a few reasons why this, I, I have not looked at this in any depth, but, but there is a, some, some things that sort of like triggered this a little bit. I mean, one thing is that, you know, there was like so much effort and thinking that kind of went into, oh, let's try to make Ethereum, you know, as decentralized as we can, that there's like lots of different validators. Now, did that work or not versus like other proof of stake chains? You can debate, right? There's some aspects in which Ethereum is maybe more decentralized. Some aspects, maybe it's like similar or to other networks, but you know, it's still, it's pretty decentralized, right? When you look at the, um, I would say the validation level and then, but now we've had this segregation of taking the rules apart and then you have this block building and all of a sudden, if you look at this block building, well, it's, it's sort of, right, you have a few block builders that produce most of the blocks. And um, and, and as you said, right, I, I guess at the moment, the ones that are kind of dominant there is the search of builders, which means they're, you know, they're also looking for what is the optimal transaction ordering and and, and finding their own things. And, and the ones best able to do that are kind of trading companies, right? They also trade on centralized exchanges. So from just the sort of, okay, what do we want this Ethereum to look like? Having a few companies like that, that in the end have this critical role, maybe doesn't seem like the most desirable outcome. So this is like one thing. And then the other thing uh, has to do with, you know, some people talking about, and I think this is also true for Faith Builder, if my, if my understanding is correct, of being like a neutral builder, right? Where where basically, okay, the, let's say there's like some builders and they kind of maybe use the information against you when you send it to them, but then there are others and they say, I, we promise we don't do that, right? Like, so 
Yeah, trust us. But of course, that also seems like a bizarre thing, right? Because all of a sudden, the whole thing is about building like trustless systems, right? With crypto and, and cryptography and, you know, decentralized network and stuff. So if then you have at the core of this whole thing, you have these block builders who, you know, claim that they do things with a certain, you know, following a certain process and that's why people use them, but actually it's based on trust and you can't like verify that you don't have like the kind of guarantees that we generally have in crypto networks. That also seems a little bit weird and it seems like the kind of thing that often you'd be like, oh, let us replace this trusted thing of the neutral block builder with something that's, you know, actually trustless. Uh, and then of course, decentralizing it, uh, is often is, I guess, generally the way that this is approached. I, I do think that there's a difference there between providing better trust guarantees and decentralizing. So like you could do block building in a centralized way while still providing strong privacy guarantees. Right. And so you can have this. Um, what is like filled through trust with like, hey, I won't front run you, I promise, be enforced cryptographically while still being operated in a centralized manner. Um, I think that's a natural evolution that things will will go towards. Um, I think the like decentralized component of it is the part that I'm I'm not seeing how it'll how it'll take place. The other like question is like let's say that we decide that we don't like that there's five whatever block builders um and we don't like that there's sort of a you know a power law distribution and dominance between them we want block building to be uniform distribution the way to do that is by creating centralization somewhere else you say okay then you put all of the order flow within a single system and you sort of selectively distribute it to various different block builders and enforce the fact that this uniform distribution happens on the block building side you just introduce the problem at a different layer, which is the the order flow aggregation layer. And then are you happy to have as like, you know, two, three different order flow systems that process all of the order flow and and Ethereum? Um, is that better? Is that like a, a meaningful improvement? Yeah, I think those those like end up being the directions of inquiry that that I get that I get concerned about. I, we also wanted to talk, I guess, about the PBS system in general. Is this the right direction in, in your thoughts? I guess we already covered it a bit, but given, you know, Brian and me, we both, like it was saying, there's like different chains and there's like different approaches to how MEV is treated. I think obviously Ethereum was sort of the first and still like the main venue where the liquidity is and everything. And um, yeah, we wanted to capture your thoughts on like, would you do it again like this or is, is PBS the right way or should should it be done differently on, on other chains? So for example, um, you know, in Cosmos, there's like different ways to, to try and handle MEV. Um, I don't know how familiar you are with them, but like, yeah, I guess just wanted to hear your thoughts on is PBS the right direction for, for proof of stake that works or are there other ways to, to handle this? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I think it was right for Ethereum. I think it was right for Ethereum at the merge. Like they needed MF boost and like that was that was probably good. Um like they needed an MEV solution at that time and it worked out. Is it right for Ethereum in the future? Is it right for other chains? Is it right for layer twos? Um it's not clear to me. Um I mean you guys have looked at this a lot, right? Like what what do you guys think? So if you look at like Cosmos chains, then it seems like there are way easier ways to address this issue. I mean, I think in the Cosmos chain, right, you already have the situation that, you know, you have validators and the validators depend on the token holders to stake with them. And the token holders, of course, want this chain to like work properly. They want their token to do well. So... If now you have some validator that says, oh, I'm going to, you know, sandwich it, you know, like, let's say you have some sort of DEX chain and then some validator says, I'm going to sandwich everyone. Then the, to uh, then the token holders are like, what the hell? This is like undermining my project. I'm not going to stake with you. Right. So that this is like one thing. 
Uh, so I think that makes it like way harder for someone to say, oh, I'm going to run this kind of strategy that you have on Ethereum, right? Because on Ethereum, I think you just have a very different landscape. So I think that's one thing. And yeah, I guess you've had a few different experiments on on Cosmos, right? Like, like for example, Osmosis, where they have uh, basically some in-protocol MEV capture, where they're, you know, they're basically running some uh, MEV bots, and then it goes kind of goes back to the stakers and uh, mostly, and then and then I guess I think in uh, DYDX, right where we have, we've done this report, where uh, there's a committee that oh wait it's like okay you cannot validators are not allowed right to do basically MEV, and then there would be some kind of taking looking at data and trying to detect things and then the ability to have, you know, slashing of validators who, who do it anyway. So these things feel like pretty straightforward and easy solution that actually solved the problem pretty well for the foreseeable future. Maybe at some point it will break down in some ways, but there it seems like proposal builder separation, it adds a huge amount of complexity. Uh, it doesn't really seem to, does it solve the core problems any better than that? I don't think so. So it doesn't feel like the right way for, at least for, let's say, Cosmos chains. Now, okay, you have other things again, Solana, I don't know, dif difficult. It, it's again very different. So, yeah. I think the one thing that's a, that PBS is, is sort of validators rejecting their power, right? In many ways, like they're saying like, all of these systems of uh, that are that do like leader selection, they essentially say, Valder, you have you have power. You have all the power and like you have to like figure out what to do with it. And and PBS is kind of like rejection of this power. Say like, oh like no, we don't want to use this power, but we want to get paid for it. And we're just going to like give this power to the highest bidder. Right? That's sort of uh that's sort of what what it says. But is that actually what's like max you know utility for the end user or is there some other approach to dealing with the power that these these validators receive and 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 the leader selection process that uh provides guarantees that are more useful for um for end users and that's you know that's how i would frame what, what you're discussing if val validators opt for constraining the types of activity or types of blocks that they produce based off of some you know, slashing mechanism or whatever else, um, you may be able to generate more more utility for for the end users, whether it's a first in first out system or um, or you know other other sort of rules. Like, I mean, even censorship rules at the end of the day are like policies that are enforced by the validators. Um, and so you can come up with sort of a framework for thinking of policies that the validators subscribe to and offer. To, uh, to the consumers of the, the block space that they offer. So, so that was also what you mentioned earlier, that this way, if you would have this sort of system, like different block builders could serve different constraints for the validators and in that way decentralize more. Is that correct? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, very interesting. I do think that there was, there is this like tendency, right? Like Brian, what you said with the DEX chain and people saying, if you sandwich everyone, you're destroying the project, but I guess at the same time, if you delegate to that validator who does it, you might get a higher yield, right? So I guess there's like a sort of issue there where if you if you just do it and delegate to this validator, it, it probably you just benefit and the chain doesn't like go to zero. But um, yeah, I, I was wondering if, if that maybe is what drives it. I mean, you, you could have, you could of course have like, yeah, say, hey, I'm going to launch a validator and I'm, I'm going to be like, maxim maximization validator and you know maybe you can generate higher returns and maybe people stake with you it's just the challenge is if you have if you have like governance i mean it is very easy then for someone to say hey we're gonna make a governance proposal and we're gonna say like hey this this guy here he's like messing up our project so i don't know we just slash them or we say this is not allowed or we we take some action that um, goes against that. I mean, I think this is maybe a little bit, I guess that's also where the whole app chain world 
you, you know, can be a bit different from the um, Ethereum world, right? Where the Ethereum world is really, doesn't really allow for that. Uh, and, you know, pros and cons on that, right? This, of course, it tells us its advantages. Have you looked at Mevburn? And do you have thoughts on it? And <laughs> we were going to ask you for your thoughts on it. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't really have, I mean, I have, I am like, aware at the at the highest level of sort of like what it its intention is but i i don't have i, I yeah it would be great if you could explain first of all what mv burn is and then what your faults are and so one of the benefits of pbs is that you have a public price for the value of blocks that are being produced right which is not something that existed in a pre mev boost pre pbs world um prior to that you sort of you could see the amount of transfers to Coinbase that were taking place, uh, and you could like you know sum it, I guess, and like see um, out of bounds like what what it looks like. But that wasn't the pri- the venue for for the price discovery to take place, right? Like if a miner wanted to have a different approach to collecting fees, like they could do so, and it wouldn't reflect the value of the blocks that they produce. Um, similarly, we sort of saw a lot of miners say like we're only distributing like block rewards to to the miners in our mining pool and we're keeping all of the mev rewards to ourselves as like our, our monetization and in some ways like that was possible because the miners didn't see sort of this one number that said like okay here's like the value of the block that i mined um you know you just know that the block reward that was included in that block so now we have we have this public value for for the blocks um and the question is like how does this value get distributed, right? Right now it's sort of left to, to the mining pool operators or node infrastructure providers to decide how they want to distribute that to their constituents. Um, most of the time it's, they keep a like percentage of those rewards and like distribute the rest. There's still some incentive to like optimize this in some way and whatever else um and there's more and more discussion about like oh maybe this like value should be redistributed to the network and not necessarily to um to validators so mev burn is essentially saying hey we see this public value is there a way to enforce that this gets burned similar to the ip 1559 rather than uh distributed to um to validators there's like interest from token holders, like ETH holders to do this. Um, and I think there's some arguments for like network stabilities and stability as to why, why, why this should be done. Um, from my view, it seems to be net negative for, for anyone who runs a validator in terms of the yield that they're going to be able to generate. Yeah, it's interesting. It seems it's beneficial for ETH holders that don't stake, right? And maybe discourages staking since the yield will be much lower um and i guess i personally also probably saw mev as like one of the revenue sources for moving away from you know inflationary token increase so tough one i think it is similar to what you know i guess in osmosis or 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 these models where essentially the map is captured by the chain and like redistributed to the token itself so I know. I, I think it's it's important that like you know people do stake and uh, infrastructure providers do run nodes. So like somewhere this revenue has to come from, and probably MEV is like a pretty good place for that. Yeah, I guess the question is also, and, and I think you, you'll have a much better understanding of this. But you know, if something like MEV burn was created, you know, are there ways to kind of route around that? Uh, you know, to through some sort of, you know, off chain, like basically trying to pretend to the chain that this block doesn't have a lot of values, so that little is burned, but actually it has more value that then is distributed in some way between, I don't know, block builders, validators in some way. Yeah. What do you, what do you thoughts on that? Yes. I mean, both EAP 1559 and like Mev Burn to me is increasing the, uh, potential value of collusion is like a way to uh, to think about it. These mechanisms all have some sort of assumption that there's some price to collusion 
that's that's higher than the benefit of it and you know therefore the collusion isn't going to um to take place it definitely seems to me that with mev burn there's a pretty strong incentive to to attempt to bypass it again mev burn is like there's like a few ideas for for how it's it's implemented and and it depends on the specifics of it and and the model that that is deployed um but the incentive is there is is it significant enough to cause a change in behavior given both economic incentive and social political incentive i don't know it's to me it's still like what what does it solve what does mev burn actually solve it's not clear i i mean i guess one thing i've heard was more that well if 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 mev that it smooths you know that you don't have like huge returns being made on some blocks and that then this sort of incentivizes more concentration in know, staking pools or something because like if you just run a few validators then you know it's going to be very rare that you earn like a lot of money from MEV and and so but I don't know that I'm not sure that's how convincing that argument is to me it smooths it by removing it Right. <laughs> okay, so it's like a it's like an anti staking pool thing. I I heard that as one. I think maybe Justin Drake uh, gave that as as one explanation for it. But yeah, I think if you sort of look at it on a high level, or maybe we should talk more about that. Actually, if we, if we, this is a, a area we we haven't really talked about, we'd love to dive into it a bit. So right now, you know, we talked about block builders and how they are basically capturing a bunch of value. Uh, but of course, uh, we have uh, maybe other places where this can happen too, right? So one would be the wallet uh, or another one might be, you know, let's say some Ethereum app that a little bit like what, uh, what uh, Uniswap or Cowswap are doing, you know, to building some kind of thing that also circumvents the MEV. I'm curious, how do you, what do you feel like was going to be the role of maybe wallets or some of these other players in the MEV supply network? My claim has always been that um, MEV is best mitigated at the application layer. If you build better applications that deal with MEV, you're able to provide better um, user guarantees and superior user experience because of that. And to me, a wallet and an application are are one of the same. The venue that the user is interfacing with to um, to get their um, their preferences expressed. Um, the role there's this like interesting role that the wallets have have played historically, which is to be both the assigner and an RPC provider, right? With like a nice UI around it. Um, but not really try to provide the um, the experience of what the user actually wants to do, right? Let's say you know that's the that's the the MetaMask thing. Like we are a browser extension, we work on all the different apps. Um, we are sort of agnostic to the type of activity that um, that you do. All we do is we provide the signing, we provide the the RPC service. A lot of MEV now is about oh maybe. The RPC service is becoming more complicated. There's all these different private venues through which you can route, not just to the public transaction pool. The type of RPC service that you use and the guarantees that you get from them is more closely tied to the type of activity that the user is doing. And so as an application developer who really cares about the user experience and like really understand what the user is trying to achieve, I would be in a better position to understand which RPC to use. So how do I negotiate this with the fact that right now that service is being handled by some external product? I want to bring that level of control over the user experience within my uh, my application. There's a bit of a tension between applications and and wallets in this way. And so I think that the natural result is we'll see more sort of separation between these things. Like more applications launch their wallets, more wallets have an application feel and sort of integrate the full sort of user life cycle within their own um, their own system. The role that they play in MEV is, is the same, right? Like they 
want to provide the best guarantees to their users to retain them and increase the level of activity that they have. That could mean protecting them from MEV. It could mean giving them better prices. It could mean selling their order flow for monetization reasons. Um, there's a bunch of different things that um, that applications can do. Cool. I, I want to ask uh, another top, like one, maybe one last topic here. So this is another er area that does, gets a lot of attention at the moment, which is intents. And I mean, what are intents? We've, we've, we before spoke about this RFQ thing, which I think is a great example of an intent, right? Where it's basically someone saying, instead of saying, you know, transaction that's like, you know, okay, do exactly this on chain. Uh, I guess mostly with trades, right? Swap X for Y. You say like, hey, uh, I want uh, I want this kind of outcome. You define some sort of criteria for outcomes, and then uh, and then you know there will be a job for somebody else to figure out what is the best way of satisfying that outcome. And you know, there's some blockchains that are very much focusing on this. I guess like Anoma is one example, but some others. And then of course there's uh, intense applications doing things like that on Ethereum. Do you think intents are going to have a major impact on this MEV supply network? Yes and no. I think intents are confusing because the way that it's being framed is as opening up a, like a very broad new set of possibilities in a way that I'm not sure how broad it is. There's a quip about intents, which is an intent is no longer an intent when it once it has product market fit. So an intent is called like an RFQ if it's like a, a swapping uh, use case, right? Or an intent is called like a bridge transaction if it's about going to uh, a different chain. So I think intents where there is a need is a like more advanced transaction types that allow for performing types of activities that you aren't able to perform otherwise that constrain the execution space based off of things that are either inefficient or have difficult trust boundaries to enforce directly on a layer one. And those seem mostly like standards um, to me. An intent that's able to have conditional execution on multiple different chains um, and able to bring constraints on external state um, is fairly interesting as a, sort of a, a model. Um, whether or it will be developed in a generalized case or a specific case, um, to me, is, is sort of a, a key question. So in this sort of infinite games uh, transaction supply network uh, framing of things, all these different transaction types, all these different message types that are being passed around are intense, right? They are... Uh, ways of communicating some preferences over what solvers on the other side are doing um, and how they're re-aggregating those, uh, those messages together. The exact format and like use cases, are all of these different messages going to use the same standards for being expressed or are they going to be very use case specific? Um, I would tend to believe that it's more likely to be use case specific. Um, while like intents can be like a very useful generalized framework for thinking about the, um, the expressivity of these messages and sort of pushing for more expressive systems, I think the development will be use case driven and it'll be about what is this more, uh, expressive message type enabling to build as an application rather than, you know, the, the message type being the, the core focus. Cool. Well, thank you so much, Stefan, for, for coming on. I think MEV feels like one of these rabbit holes that's just like complex and changing at a really rapid rate and also really fundamental uh, for, you know, how all these systems are going to work in the future. So it's really great to, you know, have you back on and talk about these things and I'm excited about the work you're doing at Frontier and, and all, the, uh, all the things that are going to come out of that. So thanks so much. Yeah, always a pleasure to come back on. Hope I had uh, a few insights that were, that were interesting. Absolutely. Cool. Thanks so much. And thanks to the listeners. Look forward to being back next week.